This is Rumble, and I am Michael Moore. Welcome, everyone. Larry Charles, my guest today, is one of the great comedic writers, producers, and directors of our time. His list of Emmy Awards and nominations are too long for me to list here on this podcast, but these are just a few of the TV shows that Larry has either written for, produced, directed, or done some combination of all three. Seinfeld, Curb Your Enthusiasm, Mad About You, Entourage, Dilbert, The Arsenio Hall Show, among many, many others. He has directed a number of films, including Borat, the original Borat, and Bruno, both of them with Sasha Baron Cohen, the incredible documentary Religious. Bill Maher's take on uh, religion. And Larry co-wrote and directed an amazing film called Masked and Anonymous. And his co-writer was Bob Dylan, and the star of the film is Bob Dylan, if you haven't had a chance to see that. In 2019, Larry released a wonderful series, and I mean a wonderful series that's still now available on Netflix and it's called Larry Charles's Dangerous World of Comedy, where Larry travels the world in search of comedians from all sorts of backgrounds and cultures to find the true meaning of comedy. It literally is a dangerous thing to watch. We'll talk a little bit about it here on today's episode of Rumble. Not only is Larry a great comedy legend, he's also a good friend of mine. It's such a, an honor to have him here. And I'm very pleased to welcome to episode 199 of Rumble, Larry Charles. Larry, welcome. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. That was quite a quite a build-up. Well, it's <laughs> it's all true, and and I've had the pleasure and the experience of actually having worked with you on uh, a couple of things, and most notably, you and I uh, uh, wrote and and we did a pilot. For CBS, this must have been back in, oh, man, 1997, 98? Yes. Back in our youth. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> we were just out of college. But we did this uh, sitcom, basically, called Better Days, about uh, these two assembly line workers in a dying auto town. It starred uh, Jim Belushi and Chris Elliott, along with others. And it's just uh, it's one of the most fascinating moments of my life. So there's so much to get into here, and I don't, I don't really want to start with the past, but we'll get to that because you have some incredible Seinfeld and Larry David Kirby enthusiasm stories uh, that maybe I can get you to share. But, but first and foremost, uh, here we are on the Fourth uh, of July uh, weekend, and I said to Basil, I said, "Geez, you know who I'd really would love to come on and celebrate America's birthday with me <laughs> is Larry Charles because Larry." I mean, I have good friends, and I have people that I work with. They're so smart, and they're funny, and all this. But, Larry, your approach to the world and to how you see it and the lens you see it through and the voice that you use, uh, the, especially the satirical voice, there is no match for you in my life in terms of you operate with reckless abandon. You are not afraid. You will not pull your punch You will go up to the line that you're not supposed to cross and then cross it. (laughs) Sometimes maybe tippy-toe back an inch. In Borat, you have Sasha Baron Cohen and his sidekick. They are in a huge fight with each other. The clothes have come off. They are naked. They are in a San Diego, I think, hotel. And they come out of the elevator and through a ballroom where there is the national convention going on of 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 uh, uh, bankers, I think some kind of banking. I think it was actually mortgage brokers. More oh, the worst mortgage brokers. <laughs> and this is and you're filming this uh, during a time that is leading up. We don't the crash of 08 hasn't happened yet, but the planning of the crash of 08 is in part happening in this ballroom of these mortgage brokers who wrecked our economy. They're in the middle of wrecking it. You don't know that the night you're there, you and Sasha. 
you go barreling into this thing and they naked wrestle through, through the mortgage <laughs> bankers convention and disrupt it while now looking back in hindsight we know they're in there plotting the the destruction of our housing market it's it's like you end up there at the crossroads and the way that this is and this is how you've been your whole life the crossroads of comedy comedy slash humor slash satire and the world we live in politics those in power all of that where did you come from how did you happen where and how did this start well, you know, what one aspect of this, Michael, and, I'm, and I don't mean to blow smoke at all, but I have to tell you, and I don't know if I've ever even told you this, but I, I, my sensibility, if not changed, if not expanded, if not blown up, um, really, really was impacted by Roger and me. Uh, seeing Roger and me, seeing what you did, uh, um, the, the chutzpah, and the balls that you displayed in that movie, and the way you were able to navigate a very, very serious subject with your very patented light tone, and really juxtapose those two, and, and make a movie that just felt so immediate, uh, as opposed to all the scripted stuff that I had been involved with, that really changed my way of thinking. And the fact that we became friends and we spent you know, some really great summers up in Traverse City, you know, that, that, that was a really just a blessing. But really, seeing your work was one of those seminal things that I went, wow, you could do that, you know? You can, you can actually kind of step into it and still maintain your humanity, still maintain your humor, not be pretentious, Talk to a wide audience about the things that are on your mind. Be funny. You know, those things really, really had a gigantic influence on me. I mean, uh, you know, I'm from Brooklyn. Brooklyn is a place where in order to survive, you have to be somewhat of a gambler and have some kind of a crazy sense of humor. But the, but the way that develops over the years can turn into many different things. And I think I was on a very kind of... Um, you know, a safer comedy path, even though my sensibility might have been dark and extreme, you know, I was working within very traditional forms. And seeing you kind of just take a camera and take a small crew and go out there and get in people's faces and be funny about it, and yet, in some ways, the humor is what made it so powerful, that really, really kind of... that something I carried with me. And it made me think about, and, I, and I'm sure you're familiar with this filmmaker from when we were kids, there was a guy named Emilio uh, D'Antonio. D'Antonio, yes. And he made a movie, and again, I think I saw it by accident, really, in, in Manhattan somewhere when I was a teenager. It was called uh, Millhouse. Correct. And it was kind of like a, a, a comedy documentary about Nixon. And I thought it was great. He used clips. He juxtaposed things. He got laughs while still making this incredible point. And at the end of the movie, I'll never forget it, he had a list, a long list, a crawl of all the corporations that had invested money in the Vietnam War. And it really sort of just blew my mind. I never even thought about, wow, companies are profiting from war, you know, you're from Brooklyn, you know, maybe I, I had read Cash 22 by that time, but still the idea that American corporations were sort of sponsoring war in these other countries, that was, again, another thing. He, his movie really was one of those things, until your movie, that I kind of kept in my head as a possibility that you could do those things. I'm always amazed when I think about the things that you've accomplished and that other people have accomplished like that. It's very unique. There's very few examples. I mean, between Milhouse and Roger and me, you would be hard-pressed to find a non-fiction comedy documentary that had as much impact. You know, So that's important to cite. I've never had a chance to, to really give you credit for that. But that is a, was a, seeing Roger and me was a mind-blowing moment for me. It's wow. like, wow, well, this, is, this is like nothing I've ever seen before. And I loved the... Um, you know, the, it was like punk. It was like punk rock. You know, it was DIY. 
you didn't ask anyone's permission. You didn't have to, like, get notes from a studio. It was liberating, very liberating to see that. And I, I wanted to have that experience. Wow. I, man, uh, <laughs> thank you for saying all that. I know we've known each other for for 20 uh, five or plus years. Um, that it's, I know people are thinking really guys, it took you to just be on the podcast with each other to say these things, <laughs> to each other. but so, I guess, you know, when, when you find soul soulmates, people that are your brothers and sisters in your life, uh, uh things need, don't need to be said because they exist in our daily lives. So, but thank you for saying that. And I, and, and I had the same influences that you were talking about. I, I saw that film, Millhouse, the, the documentary, Emil D'Antonio, and um, he made another film called uh, In the Year of the Pig. Right. And, um, and I remembered when I saw Millhouse in Ann Arbor, I had to drive from Flint to Ann Arbor as a teenager, and um, they had, a, they had a, an opening uh, short uh, called Checkers. <laughs> it was... It was right, Nixon's right. checker speech, and then this incredible film. This it hit, that film had a huge influence on me. Uh, Kevin Rafferty and uh, Kevin and Pierce Rafferty's and uh, uh, documentary in the early '80s called Atomic Cafe. Uh, right. Again, using humor to talk about how we were essentially heading toward the end of the world. Um, but why? But you're right, though. It is. I thought after Roger Me, frankly, and I thought, oh man, this is going to be so great because I've maybe maybe opened the door up a little bit. Warner Brothers is distributing the film, so it tells filmmakers, hey, you can do this. You can use humor and politics together, and you can make it a film with facts, nonfiction, but but you can also be funny. Why? I thought the, the floodgates would open. That didn't happen really, and and you know, and it's. Why not? I don't. This is the part I don't understand. Why don't more filmmakers, documentary filmmakers, use uh, uh, humor? Obviously, religious. Your film uh, is definitely is clearly full yeah. of all of that. But um, I don't know if I've ever told you. I was on the Academy board uh, for a few years, the Oscars, and each year uh, you could nominate other people who should uh, be in the Academy, and you could nominate them to be in your branch. So one year I, I nominated you to be in the docu- the documentary branch and not just because of religious and the other things, but I stood up and I made the case for why Borat is a documentary. It's a piece of nonfiction filmmaking that essentially pretty much everything you see in the film actually happens in real life, in real, it happened, it was filmed. Uh, the, there's only one fictional element in it and that's Borat, but that's the genius of the film is that you take a fictional character and place him in all these nonfiction settings from the Christian boarding house down south to the rodeo uh, uh, somewhere in Texas where they where mangles the Star, Star Spangled Banner and everything else. Those were all real, and those were all very dangerous, including the mortgage brokers, dangerous situations to insert the fictional character. But, but what a great idea, Larry that you and Sasha had figured out we can tell greater truths by having one, just one little element here of untruth, this fictional character, but it is going to expose so much truth because we're going to place the fictional character in nonfiction, a nonfiction setting. You guys, you must have talked about this. You clearly have thought about this for some time. And I still call it one of the greatest documentaries (laughs) Ever well, made. I, I appreciate that also. And I think, you know, let's remember that Sasha was also, I mean, this is another big impact on me, big influence on me. Sasha was practicing this stuff on the Ali G show where he was blurring that line. And what I was able to do with him was create these alternate realities. So it was as much of reality to the people involved in the movie as any other aspect of their life because they thought, they thought Borat and Bruno, for that matter, was a real person. And operated as if this was reality. And sometimes in the middle of an interview, I remember this happened quite a bit, people would stop the interview and start to kind of go off the rails in a good way, comedically, and they'd say to me, if I was in the room, sometimes I disappeared, but if if I was in the room, they would say, is this real, is this real? And I would go, "Um, yeah, yes, absolutely, this is real. And what I wouldn't say to them is, it's just not the reality you're thinking of, you know? 
It's not the reality you believe, but it is reality. Believe me, you'll see it in a movie someday. So I, I think there's a, a, you know, another person that kind of plays into this, that blurs that line, and I'm sure that um, you appreciated his work also, and of course he died prematurely, was Andy Kaufman. Oh, um, yes. I was a writer on Fridays, which was a live late night TV show that lasted for a couple of seasons on ABC. And, you know, it was a sketch show like Saturday Night Live. And, um, you know, it was hit or miss. But Andy Kaufman came on and um, disrupted the reality of the organized, uh, uh, controlled liveness of the show um, and created chaos. And again, I was like, wow, I can't, I, I, I was blown away once again. My mind was blown by somebody thinking more deeply about the medium, about the meaning of things, about the significance of all the elements that we take for granted. And then, uh, you know, kind of unmooring that and deconstructing that. And that was also another big influence on me. And in fact, I used to talk quite a bit to Sasha about Andy Kaufman. And he wasn't even quite familiar with him because he was in England. And But he was kind of, Sasha, in his own way, doing that same thing. Mm-hmm. You, you you mentioned growing up in Brooklyn. Um, do, am I right? Do I remember you telling me at one point in your childhood you were growing up in the Trump villages? The- yes, Trump Village, yes, down by uh, the end of Brighton Beach and Ocean Parkway near Coney Island. Tor Coney Island. So this is the housing. It's still there, by the way. Yes, that was owned by Trump's father. Right. And um, and of course, at that time when you're growing up, you don't even know what it means to be growing up in Trump Village, I guess. But um, <laughs> right. it just, I, there's just something about the whatever how the stars align. I just love the fact that you grew up in Trump Village, and and then went on to do you know what you've done. But it's um, well. You knew something was wrong. I'll tell you that. I mean, I <laughs> yeah. didn't know that Donald Trump, of course, would become Donald Trump. But if you ever saw, and you, I'm sure you have seen a picture of Fred Trump, he's yeah. one of the scariest, most satanic people mm-hmm. I've ever seen. He was a frightening presence when he would show up to various things, like the opening of the Little League field or whatever. He was a scary, scary guy, and I was like, wow. This, there's something, e- I don't even understand it, but there's something evil going on here. Even as a little kid, I kind of had an instinct about that. As a kid, you knew that, that and, and but but yet you didn't have the thought as a child, I must do something about this to stop, <laughs> right, the, de- right, to stop yeah. the demon seed from, from continuing. Well, you know, um, I love uh, uh, reading, uh, going to your Instagram and your tweets and everything, and Man, um, I'll, I'll post a couple of them here so people listening can uh, g- get uh, a dose of what you've been putting out over the last year, two, three. Um, what is it about the time we're living in? And this is this is you know, this is my Fourth of July question to you. Right. Where where the fuck are we? And and you know, so many people are so nervous and so worried that um, we aren't really through the worst of it that Trump hasn't gone away, that the people that support Trump, that he got 11 million more votes than he did the first time, that people loved what they saw in those four years and came out for him, but there were many, many more millions of us, so therefore he's not in the White House. But um, it's it, it, it just, I'm just curious, your th- you know, I haven't talked to you in a number of weeks here, and, and uh, just curious what your thoughts are about what's going on right now and everything that's happening. I mean, I, I remember a month ago um, what you were posting about um, uh, Israel uh, bombing the civilian uh, population there in, in Gaza. And um, man, that was, I, I love it when I read or see something of yours on Instagram and I go, wow, um, mm, I don't know. Could I, could I do that? I don't know. Well, you know, it, you know, when I was a kid in Brooklyn, one, one of my best friends was a, a guy named Neil Lipschitz, who today is one of the executive editors of the Wall Street Journal, actually. And he and I used to hang out, and we would watch what was going on, like in the playground, and people were, you know, there was just like a lot of surrealism going on, a lot of like inexplicable behavior. We'd go, wow, the world is crazy. And I realized, like, here I am, like 50 years later, still thinking, wow, the world is crazy, It's and, and it seems crazier than ever. We seem to be 
in the throes of like a cult weirdness that's taken over America, even though it, 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 there may have been more votes for Biden, the fact that there are tens of millions of votes for somebody like Donald Trump, who if you grew up in New York, you had his number back in the day that he could have risen despite that to this level. And now look at what's going on. I mean, he's guilty of all kinds of obvious crimes, but you know he's going to get off. And we see Bill Cosby being released today, and you just feel like, wow, we're moving further and further away from justice, from truth, from equality, uh, despite the fact that Biden's in office, despite the fact that Kamala Harris is vice president, despite the fact that the squad exists, they're a minority. It feels like like the truth has become a minority stance. And I can't really explain. People are desperate, maybe. People are frightened. Uh, people are lonely. And maybe they turn to these uh, uh, sort of outlets to express themselves, to feel part of some community because they feel so alienated. Mm -hmm. But power seems to have solidified in ways that's very distressing to me. You're rightly angry about the situation that we still find ourselves in. And while a lot of people just have wanted to go after four years, okay, I just need a rest. You are not acting like you want to rest. You are, you are like a clarion call telling people this is the way it is. Let's get real, folks, and let's get busy. And it's, uh, um, man, I, I, it, it fires me up. It really, you, it gives me some inspiration to see you just going for it. Do you ever stop and think, I have children? Me, maybe, maybe. I have, I have grandchildren at this point. That's right. You have grandchildren. Yes. Um. Yeah. I, I, I worry about about my kids, but I worry about, I worry about everybody. I mean, I, I'm worried that we are leaving. I mean, because there are political issues that seem to be unraveling and out of control, but you look at the, the climate, you know, I'm here in California and, you know, you look at the Northwest, you know, Portland and Seattle having temperatures they've never had before. And we're, you know, talking about um, the central Valley of California, where most of the agriculture in the country comes from, you know, is drying out. It's going to be a desert soon, you know, and I don't think people are really absorbing the truth of, wow, what happens when the water's gone? What happens when you don't have food in the supermarket? We had a little glimpse of that during the COVID, uh, the, the midst of the pandemic. You might go into a store and see empty shelves, but I've been to Liberia and Somalia and countries like that where they don't have anything. They don't have clean water. They don't have access to food. They don't have access to resources. And we're, we're only one step away from that. And I, and I don't think people are at all prepared. I think they're being snowed about the, re no pun intended, about the reality of that. And that's something that I feel like, wow, I, I have seen that. I have observed it. I need to share those kind of uh, insights with people and hope that it has some kind of, uh, you know, impact. It has some sort of lasting value. Yeah, so do I, because your warnings, your, the warnings and the things that you post on Instagram, I think, God, I hope people are listening to this. I hope they are watching this. Don't turn away, please, people. Um, pay attention to this. Uh, these are, are warnings that need to be heeded. And, and, I mean, Larry, I mean, really... Beyond that, beyond what you and I do uh, to uh, with uh, media and film and and uh, writing and all that, what what is it that we can do, or what can people maybe who are listening to this, what can they do to um, to act? Because I, like you, fear that time is slipping away at a much faster rate than we realize, and um, the. The uh, we're not out of the woods uh, with this virus. Uh, we have no idea what's in, in front of us. When I saw that map of Canada this <laughs> week on the weather map, and the Canada had their hottest day ever, like in the history of Canada, any day, 116 degrees. And then it showed the swath of that heat wave going up in the 90s across the Arctic Circle. Yes. In the 90s in Canada. And I thought... Holy shit, we're, 
Paris Accords, we well, we're going to fix this by 2050. Are you fucking kidding me? I don't know. I don't know if we have 50 months left. Uh, That's so true. Uh, I mean, that, it's, that it's, I think we have been, you know, look, I think people, it's hard to face, uh, you know, it's, it's maybe fun to watch a movie about the apocalypse or watch a movie about UFOs or watch, you know, entertainment about these things. But I think really our entertainment has become kind of another arm of propaganda to some degree so that we can kind of have this sort of vicarious experience of what it's like to have no water or have no food or have a nuclear winter or whatever it might be. And the reality doesn't therefore set in. We keep it at arm's length, you know. And I guess what I'm trying to do is say, you know, strip away all of that because it's happening to you right now and you don't even realize it. And one of the reasons I do these little videos is, you know, having been in, in Africa and the Middle East, I've seen how the mass media has broken down and people are sort of just taking their cameras, taking their phone cameras and shooting their version essentially of The Daily Show, you know, without any production, just kind of talking to the camera and bypassing the government media, the mass media to go directly to the audience. And I guess that's what I'm trying to do. It seems like a very immediate form of communication Yes. Um, that I'm able to sort of, you know, reach people without, you know, the day that I think of that thing, I can write it, I can shoot it, and I can put it out rather than submitting it to a corporation that has to give me notes that I have to sort of wait on. And by the time it comes out, so much time has passed. There's an immediacy to that that I think is part of how I see the problem you know, because the problem is immediate, and we're not um, dealing with it like an immediate problem. We're dealing with it like it's going to be somebody else's problem. But whose problem is it going to wind up being? Our children, our grandchildren, uh, the people of the world are going to suffer. They're suffering now. And so it seems like the best way for me to communicate right now. So what do you, I mean, I've been thinking about this during the year and a half we've had here uh, during the coronavirus uh, you know, staying locked down as I have. Um, I think you've been in a kind of a similar uh, situation. Yeah. So we've had a lot of we've had a lot of time to think, and and certainly our, our way our minds work. Or there's a certain uh, there's a certain um, no holds barred creativity sometimes that's going on. Think I should do this or that or whatever. I'm just so I've been thinking about what is my next step. Do I go? Do I go back into the world that we used to have, where we have these large corporations that own the media companies or whatever? Um, and you know, uh, Netflix—they will—they will have you back, Larry. And and uh, uh, Prime will have me. And you know, they—I have no doubts about that. But but what do we do with that? And what? I mean, what, I'm just curious. I, I have not had a chance to ask you uh, this, and you don't have to share it if you don't want. But you must have been spinning your wheels here uh, in your head over these last months of w when this is over or almost over post pandemic, how do I Larry Charles come out of this and use my uh, creativity and my thought process uh, to reach uh, millions of people uh, that I want to reach? Well, as you know, it, that's always a challenge uh, because um to get things distributed properly. First of all, we don't even know, Michael, what distribution of our ideas is going to look like in the future, in the near future. Right. Um, are people going to go back to movie theaters like nothing ever happened? Are people going to rely more and more on TV, more and more on, on cable and, uh, you know, the, the, the Amazons and the Netflixes of the world? Which, by the way, I appreciate on a certain level, too. I mean, my show, The Dangerous Comedy Show, was on Netflix, and I'm grateful to them for putting it on. You know, I really, really am. Absolutely, I, I don't yeah. know if I would have been able to do it that without their help. Maybe not. That's right. Um, so it's a, it's a it's a thin line between you know being part of that system and rebelling against that system at the same time. And uh, I, I don't have a definitive answer to that. I know that as you as you say, my creative juices have been spinning. I actually made a movie a documentary over the course of the pandemic that I've just finished uh, that I think, you know, is going to hopefully be on the air soon at some point or in the next couple of months. So, uh, you know, I, I kept working, but I also 
realize, wow, I'm in the house here, I, you know, and I, you don't need a lot of money. I've been to so many of, like I said, these, these, these men and women in these uh, undeveloped countries who sort of had an iPhone and were able to make a TV show with it, you know. And yeah. um, so I thought that's what I should be doing is not relying on the system so much and just making stuff and putting it out there, you know, whether it's on a YouTube channel or on Instagram, which, again, is owned by Zuckerberg, and I recognize there is some, you know, kind of conflict in that, but that is a place where you can put your stuff out, put your thoughts out, put your ideas out, uh, whether it be TikTok or Instagram or Twitter, and, you know, it's there, and people have a chance to look at it, people have a chance to directly communicate with you, it's a very immediate form of, of art, in a sense, and a new form of art. And I feel like, you know, that's, that might be where the future lies, you know. Mm -hmm. And we may be breaking down this system where everything has to be through a studio, everything has to have stars. All those things are kind of like very, very, um, you know, top-heavy at this point, you know. And they, because of that, they have to lack immediacy. And they also, you know, are there to sort of lull us to a large degree to into a sense of complacency, you know. Right. And and I guess what I'm trying to do is fight all of that while still being part of the system and like one foot in and one foot out. And that's a that's a tough, as you know, that's a tough that's a tough position to hold. It's, tough, it's hard but, to but, have that balance. But you and I have been able to navigate that, and and I think and we have also learned. That every one of these entities, whether it's Warner Brothers uh, or Netflix or y y y Hulu, uh, you name it, uh, there are good people working at all of these places. There are uh, fellow travelers, <laughs> so to yes. speak, and and they will do their damnedest to get our work out there to the American people and to people around the world. Can you tell us what what this documentary is that you've been working? On? Are you able to uh, share that with us? I don't. I can't say quite yet. That's okay. Only because I just, I just am not ready to to, to say what it is. Um, it, will it, will it, but it, it will have access to it. It won't be just on the Canadian broadcasting. Assistance. No, no. It'll be on. It'll be on a major cable network, uh, it, which has already been established. Um, but I just want to make sure that everything is in place and. They don't yeah. change their mind or anything like, you know, I yeah. mean, uh, you know, until it's real, look, look at the pilot that we made. We were told, if you remember, oh to start God. hiring writers, to yes. start, you know, to come to New York to do the upfronts. Yes. And then suddenly we were told it's, it's over. And it the, took the us a while to they figure gonna... out what had gone wrong. Yes. And so, you know, I, 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 I'm kind of um, superstitious that way, I guess. No, I think that's right to be that way because I remember that night, uh, when they make it in May, all the announcements for the new fall shows, and we got the word that we've been picked up and get ready, come to New York, whatever. And um, and then the night, the night before, we get a call from one of the executives at the network saying, look, we love the show, but uh, you know we have to run these by our main advertisers. And three of the top ten advertisers on television said they would never advertise <laughs> On this show, and um, I think I can say their names now. Um, uh, one was General Motors, and one was Nike, and one was Procter and Gamble. And th yes, <laughs> they Which, by, the, by the way, I never even knew until that happened, and I've been doing it a while. At that point, I never yeah. knew until that happened that pilots were shown to advertisers before they were picked up. Oh, yeah. To make sure that they would be endorsing them and supporting them when they got on the air, and that GM and these other companies had seen a pilot with your name on it yes. about about dis disaffected auto workers and but said, a comedy, "You got to be but kidding! A you got to be kidding us! <laughs> you know, we're not we're not going to support this show." No, and that yeah. that would be enough to stop it from getting on the air, despite it being creatively. You know, satisfying, entertaining, oh. funny, pointed, yes. great performances, <laughs> all those things that a, that a great TV show has, uh, it didn't matter in the end. And the network had tested it with these focus groups all across the country. And, and it, we came back with, like, the highest marks. Uh, they never would let us on if we hadn't tested well with the American people. Right. So, so all of that <laughs> had happened. And then, but I had learned, 
actually before this, with my uh, uh, television show, TV Nation. It was on NBC. And um, I learned that, and I learned this, this is like an hour before it's going to air on the whatever night, Tuesday night it was on. And, and uh, they called over from NBC saying that um, you make a mention of McDonald's in your episode. And McDonald's is a uh, sponsor of the show. And they do not like the joke. And so, therefore, we, we have an hour to remove all the McDonald's commercials and insert them with some other commercial. I had never known that literally all of our episodes, and I'm sure this, is, this was true with Seinfeld. I'm sure it was, it's been true with every, certainly, broadcast network. The sponsor, somebody at the sponsor watches the show and makes the final decision where the American people get to see it or not, or they pull their spots. And the other thing I learned is that the insurance company for the network, there's an insurance man that watches every single episode and has to approve it, has to sign off saying there's, there's, there's no uh, libel or slander or anything here that's going to get us a lawsuit. And it's amazing. The American public does not know that whatever they're watching on, on TV um, has to first be approved by an insurance company and by a sponsor or two or three. And you're right. I learned that for the first time, and I was like, "Wow!" Yeah, these, sh- I, I, these are all <laughs> these were all revelations to me as well. I mean, you know, I, I had dealt with censors quite a bit, but I realized as time went on, the censors are kind of just like the tip of the iceberg. That insurance, uh, uh, you know, sponsors, those people were really driving the the choices to a large degree. And you're right. This discrepancy, this discrepancy between. The, what an audience craves and what is permissible to put out over the airwaves is all, it's often a very big gap. And, um, and that's why it's great to have, a, a, you know, these, these alternative outlets, which we did not have at that time. I mean, we might have been able to take something like Better Days and, you know, put it on YouTube, you know. Right. And there right. may have been other outlets, but at that time there were not. The idea of uh, social media did not exist. Uh, the idea of computers really just were barely existing at that time. So um, things like the internet. So um, it, it's a technology also drives a lot of this uh, innovation as well, you know. And ultimately, the technology can also drive uh, an increased form of censorship too. Well, I'm I'm excited to hear that you've made this I'm, i will look forward to it and and if there's anybody from any of the large conglomerates that are listening to this uh we're just really talking about something pretend larry hasn't really made anything and uh, don't don't worry about it we're we're all gonna be okay but let me let me just ask you about comedy uh, just a, a couple uh, just questions about uh, because i mean you did start you did do stand-up you did you did work for fridays you did you lived in the comedy world for a, a long time and, and, and then at some point, um, you know, you and Larry David, uh, Seinfeld, others uh, thought maybe this could be even smarter and that the American people aren't as stupid as maybe we, we treat them to be. And, um, and so, you know, we ended up with these great shows. But, the, but comedy and, you know, our good friend Bill Maher has been harping on this now for some time this past year or two about the cancel culture and all this. And, you know, I, I still don't get what exactly what the problem is. I mean, I understand that, yes, with, with comedy, you, you are supposed to say things that are offensive and people will be offended and all that. But it also, there's this clip that's going around now. I don't know if you've heard, seen it or heard it lately on the Internet from Larry King interviewing George Carlin. And this is, this is God knows how many years ago. Um, but he he brings up Andrew Dice Clay and George Carlin, um, who you know was never afraid to say anything or be offensive in any way what, whatsoever, had a v- kind of a nuanced and very interesting and I thought uh, important way. Of, can I just play this? I want to play this. If you you know what I'm talking, I don't know if you've heard it or seen it. Yet I, on the I've internet. I've seen other things like this. I don't know if I've heard this exact clip, but I'm happy to listen to it because comedy is going through its own its own changes right now. Yes. And some of it's good, and some of it is, oh, no, 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 I don't want to lose. Th- this is what th- our ability to laugh and, um, and and laugh at things we're nervous about is very important. And so, anyways, let me just, this is, this is George Carlin many years ago on 
uh, the Larry King Show, talking about Andrew Dice Clay. If, if you are of a younger generation, you don't know who he is. How, Larry, how, how would you describe Andrew Dice Clay? He, 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 was a, he had a persona that was extremely sexist and um, rude and disrespectful, you know, but it was a persona. And um, it created a lot of controversy at the time, more in, in a way like sort of Sam Kinison. And George Carlin was very influenced by Sam Kinison and some of that comedy as well at that time in his life. I would defend to the death his right to do everything he does. The thing that I, that I find unusual, and it's, you know, it's not a criticism so much, but his targets are underdogs. And comedy traditionally has picked on people in power, people who abuse their power. Uh, women and gays and immigrants are kind of, to my way of thinking, underdogs. And, um, you know, he ought to be careful because he's Jewish. And a lot of the people who want to pick on these kind of groups, the Jews are on that list a little further. You got women, gays, gypsies, blah, 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 blah. And then suddenly you find Jews. And, and Andrew, suddenly Andrew's arrested. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, he, obviously he should do what he wants. And uh, Why does he get away with it, do you think, then? Well, because we have never a, laughed at jokes about the Well, he's war. appealing. I think he's appealing largely. I think his core audience are young white males who are threatened by these groups. I think a lot of these guys aren't sure of their manhood because that's a problem when you're going in through adolescence. You know, am I really? Am I? Could I be? I hope I'm not one of them. And the women who assert themselves and are competent are a threat to these men, and so are immigrants in terms of jobs. And and uh, and, and the so that's home. why we, as an audience, then will laugh. I, you say we. I don't think you mean. I don't know. But I, I mean, think you're collective that, we. I think that's what what is at the core of that experience that takes place in these arenas is a certain. Uh, a, you know, a, a sharing of, of uh, anger and rage at, 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 these, at these targets. And I'm sure Andrew isn't that angry at them. I'm sure he's playing it as a comic. I found that really interesting. And, uh, yeah. and I've, without ever having articulated it in that way, always felt like it's always funnier and satire works the best when you go after those in power, those who are abusing others in our society, to punch down, to punch down on, on people who are just struggling to get by. I don't know. I just never found that funny. But he says something else that's really interesting too. There, I think he, I think he's right on in terms of his insights, and, and usually was George Carlin. I mean, that's what made him so brilliant. But he says something else that's really important, and that I also very much agree with. He basically is saying, look, and this goes to our cancel culture today, or whatever that is. Let we have freedom of speech. Say whatever you want. Say anything you want, and I believe this. Let anybody say anything they want, but stand behind it, accept the responsibility, accept the consequences of it. Don't cower after you've said something that's rude or disrespectful or insulting to whomever. Stand behind it. Take responsibility for what you say. Part of what freedom of speech is is the responsibility of standing behind what you say. If you want to say those things, go right ahead. I don't believe in censoring anybody about anything, but I believe that you must take responsibility for what you say. And I think that's that kind of is the way to balance those things. And in truth, after a certain point, Andrew Dice Clay did pay that price. You know, he, he had those people laughing for a long, long time, but eventually... He, you know, the, the responsibility that went along with, with speaking that kind of humor, with spewing that kind of humor, came back to haunt him, and he wound up being rejected. He wound up being a kind of a, a fad rather than like George Carlin, who was also very politically incorrect, but, but was able to talk to people and communicate people and be honest with people. You know, he wasn't doing a persona George Carlin. He was who he was, the way Richard Pryor was. And that's why I believe there's that difference. George Carlin was willing to stand behind what he said, where Andrew Dice Clay, once that heat started to be felt from him, he was mm -hmm. like, well, it's not me, it's this character. And he kind of bailed on it to some degree. And I don't think, you know, I think that's sort of a, a kind of a dishonest way of avoiding the responsibility for saying the things that you said. So when you look at the landscape of comedy now, in 2021, and let's call it in the in the upcoming post-pandemic era, how do you see it? Where is it going to go? Where are the have the lines uh, shifted? Is there are there even better ways that, that we haven't thought of to use wit and 
being clever and being satirical. And I think one of the biggest changes that I perceived, and again, this has something to do with my travels in these other countries, is that there are a lot of voices. There's a multitude of voices that up until, you know, we, we, you hear Republicans, you hear Trump, you hear all these people complaining about cancel culture. It's like white men have basically dominated comedy like they've done, and I'm a white man, obviously, and, and, and a Jew from Brooklyn, like a lot of great comedians, but we have dominated comedy for most of the history of comedy. You know, you have Richard Pryor, you have examples of the past of people who came along and broke through, but generally speaking, comedy on television and movies and on stand-up have been essentially, it's been essentially a white man's medium, you know? And I think what's happening now and what frightens people for some reason is that there are new voices. There are gay voices. There are Asian voices. There are LBGTQ voices. There's all kinds of voices now who are discovering their language of comedy. And it's different. It's different reference points than the comedy that we grew up on. And you have to be open to that. And I think that is a healthy thing. I think right now we're seeing this kind of fragmentation of comedy where like, you know, the white comedians are over here and the gay comedians are here and the black comedians are here and the Asian comedians are here. But the truth is that we are kind of figuring out, we're evolving our comedy language to reflect modern times, you know, and I think that's a healthy thing in the long run. Oh, it's so, I think it's so healthy. And and I have, I have been entertained running across all all kinds of different voices. First of all, just on your Netflix thing, uh, just so people understand, Larry like goes to places like Somalia and uh, a, a Muslim country and places, and the comedy is incredible. And we are not exposed to this. We are not shown the humanity that comedy offers us in understanding our fellow inhabitants of this planet and uh, that's why I love I loved your the series so much because it's right. like I didn't expect this, you know, or they, or you're or you're going here this week. Okay, well this I know that last week was well that guy was funny, but this woman in this and this is okay. Well, I'm gonna watch it because it's Larry, and then it's like pff, blow my mind. It's like oh my god, you know, where's the Netflix of Bangladesh? <laughs> it was like you yeah, know, it surprised it, me also. I didn't I didn't expect it to have that kind of impact on me. You know, mm. seeing, uh, uh, you know, we, again, in this country, what, you know, what is cancel culture in this country? You know, if you pay a price, you pay a price with your career, with economics. But, but in these countries, when you pay a price, you may be assassinated, you may be jailed. You know, the, the yeah. price, the stakes for comedy in these other countries is much, much higher. And therefore, there's an urgency and an importance to the comedy in these places, as well as the healing properties of comedy in these places that we here don't don't really feel. You know, we don't have to feel that we can think of comedy as entertainment, but comedy is a lot more than entertainment in these places. It's the last vestige of truth. You know, it's the last place for catharsis in a society that's kind of closed down, you know. And um, that really surprised me, that healing quality that comedy has in a country like Liberia where the Ebola crisis really allowed comedy to sort of arise, ironically enough, because people had no place else to turn, they weren't getting answers, and so finally people were talking about that, talking about this kind of idea of what do we do, and the comedy industry in Liberia, such as it is, arose out of that crisis, you know. We'll see whether that kind of comedy arises out of the pandemic that we've we, we are still experiencing to some degree, um, whether that will sort of bring us new voices in comedy. I hope so, you know, uh, because that's that's That'd a possibility. Great. That's that's an option for us to, to, to hear new voices, to hear new language, to hear new reference points that can make us laugh at ourselves and at our situation. I, also, I think, too, that, that comedy is such a great, it's the flip side of the anger coin, and it's a great way to express your anger is through humor. And, you know, just from my studying the history of comedy, um, it seems like some of our greatest comedians, and you can go back back to the Marx Brothers, 
um, Lenny Bruce, Richard Pryor. Um, they were in their personal lives, you know, pretty upset people. They were angry. They were angry at, at the social condition, the human condition, uh, whatever. But it was their humor that gave them the avenue out to get this out and to express it and to let other people, as you say, cathartically feel the same thing because people sitting in that club with Lenny Bruce or, or listening to Richard Pryor are going, yeah, yeah, fucking A right, yeah. And yeah, I think I think Borat did a, a similar thing. I think it tapped oh, into geez. it tapped into the and I think your work has done this also. It taps into something that has been been latent in the society under the surface. And there are the, there are these feelings that are are not considered appropriate to express. And comedians, uh, uh, part of their skill is finding a language to express these unspoken feelings in a way that we can all share communally. And I think that is a, a, one of the great, that's what makes comedians so important to the society. They are the truth tellers, especially in a world of, of politics and corporations. You're looking, you're seeking, you're craving someone to tell you what's really going on. And there are, you can turn to comedians to get that truth. And they play a very crucial role in that, in that way. And in these other countries, where there's even more censorship and more oppression and more danger, the comedian's role is even more precious. So what's going on right now in, in the world uh, for you in terms of when you see things, when you see things going on this week, last week, whatever, that just like, you know, whatever the rage you might feel, uh, your, your eye, your comedic eye, your satirical eye uh, uh, comes forward and allows you to have a response um, and that you often you know, share with us. But I'm just, I, I mentioned Israel, Palestine earlier, this, this thing with surf, the, the building that crumbled in Surfside, Florida. Um, it's, it's, it, I wanna scream at the TV because nobody is really talking about what needs to be talked about with any of these issues. And I'm just, cu- just curious uh, you know, what, what your take is on some of the stuff that we're dealing with right now. I think, yeah, I think there are a lot of uh, punch-in-the-gut kind of moments. Like, just even today, you know, seeing that Bill Cosby was freed on kind of a technicality. Um, right. uh, they overturned realize, his conviction, right? Yes. They, the Supreme Court in Pennsylvania. So he can't be tried again. This is it. This is He's out, and, uh, and it's like it didn't happen. Exactly, exactly. And, and you see that Trump is also going to, you know, he's not going to be arrested. He's not going to be indicted. If anything, the Trump organization might get some sort of, you know, minor tax thing, you know, it's like, it's, it's not, it's not satisfying, you know what I mean? It's not satisfying to see justice meted out so unequally. Um, it, it, it seems patently unfair while so many people are rotting in jail, while so many victims have absolutely no outlet uh, for justice to see wealthy men and again, they are men, uh, usually, uh, who are able to walk away and, um, and, and, and skirt, and no pun intended, the, the, uh, you know, the criminal justice system. So that's the kind of stuff. I mean, even in Surfside, clearly you see the corruption of the building commissions, of the landlords. You know, they yeah. knew this was coming. Uh, they did nothing about it, and they allow people to die as a result. And then well, they'll gloss over these things, or they'll settle, or you know, there'll be there'll be some way of kind of just like the opioid crisis with the Sacklers. It's like nobody's really paying the price. Nobody's really feeling the consequences of their behavior on that level, and it just seems super unfair to me. And it's outrageous, and people feel more and more powerless. In the wake of it, yes, and I, I don't know. I, I have some weird hope that um, just I mean, you and I have both spent time in South Florida uh, for various reasons, <laughs> and um, the um, it it really hit home. I went down there a week or two after the Parkland massacre at the high school. There, those kids were so sharp and so angry and so right on and. Um, and in that school was a combination of, of kids who were Hispanic, were Jewish, were Muslim. Um, and I was, I thought, wow, man, it, Larry, even though we haven't 
handed our kids and our grandkids a the better world that we had hoped for many many years ago we have we have raised the, these kids and uh and i know your kids and i and i my daughter and every, i know that they <laughs> i'm sorry to put this on their shoulders but they are going to fix a lot of this shit and um and and so for that i guess i have you know i have that level of hope but, you've always um, been a, 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 a you know this is one of your beautiful traits i think you've always managed to find optimism and hope in these very very bleak situations i mean i think that's a key to both your personality just getting to know you as a human being and to your work as well and it's something that i i aspire to i think i'm I'm a little less forgiving than you are in that respect. But, you know, I, you, you see, like, even with, you mentioned Parkland, I mean, uh, you know, and, and these kids who have suffered, not, not just the kids who were killed, which is horrible enough, and the parents and the families of those, of those children who were murdered, but also the people that were, the kids that were around it who were traumatized by these events. Nothing, nothing's really being done for them. And beyond that, you have people walking around still to this day which just seems insane, who say it didn't happen. It was a false flag operation. It's like, not only is it like a, a spitting on, on these poor children's graves, but, you know, it's like they are allowed to go around and say that without consequences. And that's that goes back to this free speech thing. You know, it's like, say it if you want to, but there, if there's no consequences to spewing that kind of hate and that kind of falsehood, it seems like there's no there's no justice then available to us uh, to, right. to remedy those kind of situations, you know. It's so insane and so surreal yeah. that that this yeah, happens. It's surreal. And it really it's gotta, is. And yet it's gotta it's, feel and yet like it couldn't be more real. It's gotta feel like to you that you're still sitting there on that bench all those years ago as a kid with Neil Lipschitz there in uh, Brighton Beach, um, and saying to each other. Man, this world's a crazy place. And yeah. yes, on this level, it hasn't it hasn't got less crazy. It's probably gotten more crazy. And I just I know we're running out of time here, but I promised uh, people just a few words of, of behind the scenes of working there with Larry David on Seinfeld. Uh, you you wrote so many of these uh, early episodes there in the first three years. Maybe share a story uh, working uh, there on that with Larry, with Jerry. I've heard some of these, and it's just, it's, God, you were part, the three of you just were part of this amazing moment where comedy did take a turn, and it, and it took a, I've, I've told you the story before, that, you know, the, the episode with the, the rye bread, and the, there, the stealing of the, the rye bread, and, and, and here's my parents in Flint, Michigan, you know, they're, they're in their 80s, <laughs> and I know, they, they are like Seinfeld show number one fans in Flint. They have no idea of any of the context of the humor behind the rye bread or what the rye bread means. But it doesn't matter because you guys, you created this show, a smart show for smart people. And even people that maybe didn't get all of it. And I, and I remember my dad saying this, what he appreciated about you and the, the, three, the three of you is that um, I may not get all the references, I but I like the fact that they think here in Flint, Michigan, I'll get it. They think they think I know enough or I'm smart enough, and it, it's so respectful of me. I'm a retired auto worker, and and this is my favorite show. Well, we got you know there's a, there's a lot of aspects to what you just said. I mean, a I myself was very lucky. I mean, I got to work with basically the John and Paul of comedy um and they were geniuses and, and larry particularly was a mentor to me from the first time i met him on fridays we we're from the same neighborhood he was older than me he took me under his wing i was just very lucky that i met him at the time that i did and he had a big impact on me as well um one of the keys to the success of seinfeld was not trying to be a success we assumed we'd do 13 episodes and it would be canceled and so let's just do what we think is funny. And we didn't worry about um, success or ratings or that kind of stuff. We just did what we thought was funny, and it wound up inadvertently, for a variety of reasons, tapping into something much larger. And I can tell you from traveling with Sasha and doing the Dangerous Comedy Show and being in the Middle East and being in Africa and places like that, 
uh, and being in South America and Uruguay, that people will come up to me all the time and go, my friend is just like Kramer, you know, or this, <laughs> my, this is my buddy, he's, he's George, you know. And it's like it doesn't matter what country it's in. It doesn't matter what language they speak. People connected to those characters because there was an underlying truth to them. Most sitcoms, as we know, have a certain contrivance to them, a certain falsity to them. And for whatever reason, Seinfeld cut through that, and there was an honesty to the dark side of human nature that we dealt with, that people needed that, needed to, to know that they were not alone when they felt these feelings. And I have found all over the world people will, you know, completely relate to those characters despite the fact that they don't have those reference points. And that's a phenomenon that I, I almost can't explain. You know, it just is... It's one of those wonderful mysteries that has taken place that I've, I've had the, uh, the fortune and the privilege to experience. Wow. Well, it's, it's, uh, it was a gift to all of us. It, of, the one, of the episodes that you wrote, I, I know I'm, it's like asking for which is your favorite child, but is there one that, you know, uh, that just that is your favorite or is one that if we were to put it in a time capsule and send it up on that Mars rover... <laughs> Uh, what, what, which one would you, which one would you pick? Well, I, I had a couple of episodes. I mean, there's an episode called the subway where I was able to, you know, one of the great things that Jerry and Larry supported me in and endorsed and, and encouraged me to do was to expand the medium, you know, expand the storytelling of the typical traditional sitcom. And in an episode like the subway, I was able to take these stories and, you know, explode them outward and then bring them back and kind of make it almost like a musical suite in a way and sort of explore those characters on their own and then have them intersect. Um, so that's that was one of my favorites because of the structure. I really enjoyed yes. playing with the structure of what a TV show, what a sitcom could be. And that, that's one that always strikes me that I, I, got, I just got very lucky and I was able to use experiences that my father had told me, and if you remember in the subway, Jerry's on the subway, mm -hmm. and the guy across from him takes off his clothes. Well, that happened to my father. I remember him telling me that story again and again when I was a kid, that he fell asleep on the subway, and when he woke up, this guy was naked, and everybody else was in the corner of the subway station. <laughs> they didn't bother waking him up, you know? Right. So to be able to use personal stuff, to be able to use conceptual stuff, to be able to play with the medium... That was just a great privilege and a great luxury that uh, I, I was very lucky to be in the right place at the right time to a large degree. Mm. Yes, and that and that particular episode uh, is so layered. I mean, this is a half hour show, and it's it's so the the you're right the um, it does it almost it plays like a piece of music. All right, Coney Island. Okay, you can take the beer, the F, and switch for the N at Broadway and Lafayette. Or you can go over the bridge to Decal and catch the queue to Atlantic Avenue and then switch to the IRT. Two, three, four, or five. But don't get on the G. See, that's very tempting, but you wind up on Smith and 9th Street, then you got to get on the R. Couldn't you just take the D straight to Coney Island? Well, yeah. <laughs> so, Larry, we are out of time, but I this has been so great. I've wanted to have you on uh, this uh, here in my first year or so of doing this uh, podcast, and I hope you'll come back. Uh, there's so many th things I want to talk to you about. I, I think of you often, uh, and, I'm, and I often I will go to your Instagram and say, "Wow, what's he's going to have a take on this? I got to see what this is." It's uh, it means a lot to me. Your friendship means a lot. The kind words that uh, you've said. I just, it really uh, means the world to me, and I look forward uh, to what is coming up uh, from you, and someday working together again would be awesome. Um, let me mention in full disclosure that also I, I started a film festival in Traverse City, Michigan, some 16 years ago. Larry has been on the board for the past decade or so of the film festival, comes uh, every year, and um, we have not We've had to cancel it the last two years, but his presence there, uh, the Q&As that you've uh, conducted, and the, the great night that we got to show Borat, thank you to you uh, and, and Sasha, we got to show it before its uh, North American premiere in Toronto uh, a couple weeks early, a little sneak of it in Traverse City, and I, I remember that night, just the laughter in that theater, uh, it really was one of those, it's not... 
hyperbole to say that it felt like the roof was going to lift off because you, it was, you could barely hear the next line. The laughter was, no, none of us had seen a movie like this. And uh, you brought it uh, to us there in Michigan. And, and I, I thank you for all of that and for the good soul that you are, uh, for the, those kids that you have raised and, uh, and everything else. Well, I cherish our friendship. I'm honored to know you. I, I often tell people that you're an American saint. You're one of the few people <laughs> whose goal is to make everyone's life better. It's uh, You're an unusual man, and I have the deepest, deepest respect and admiration for you. I hope we get a chance to hang out again soon. I hope we get a chance to collaborate. Um, next time, maybe we'll talk about the Toronto Film Festival when the when the oh. film broke and oh, we had right. to go up on stage and vamp um, <laughs> and we wrote notes to people for, to, so they could uh, be excused from school the next day. I don't know that's, if you remember that. That's right. Oh my but, God. That's um, a great story. So, yes. yes we, you have, you have played a, a major role in my life and in my, my developing sensibility. And um, there's no price to put on that. I, I'm, I'm just very lucky yeah. to have crossed paths yeah. with you. And well, thank likewise. You. I'll come back. Anytime you like. Of yes, thank you for that. And, and, and the same back at you here. Um, uh, I'm sure many people know that person or people, it's not many in your life, that the, the, the absolute uh, goodness and, and luck, in some sense, that, that they entered your life uh, and, and how much better it, they made it. And Larry, obviously, you are one of those people for me and i can't thank you enough and thank you for being part of my fourth of july <laughs> weekend <laughs> weekend <you>. episode <laughs> yes and uh and uh, we'll we'll talk further uh everyone larry charles the the great comedy writer producer director director of borat director of religious uh and um larry charles is a dangerous world of comedy and some some unspoken piece that's that is awaiting us shortly uh, uh uh that i will make sure isn't killed by corporate america <laughs> uh thank you larry uh thank for you this. very much michael be, be well thank you you too man i'll talk to you very soon well that was great i, I hope uh, all of you enjoyed uh, listening uh, to that uh, look on the description page here i'll have some links a couple of uh, larry's uh, instagram postings we can get uh, one of the Seinfeld episodes that he wrote up there. That would be great. And maybe a, a clip or two from um, Borat or Religious. So many great works from Larry Charles. And I hope you enjoyed listening in on this conversation between uh, two old friends. I hope everybody's having a good weekend. My true sympathies for the people uh, down in Florida and everywhere else in the world, uh, whether it's a, a place that our new president bombed in the last week or whether just everybody doing their best to get through this what we're all going through as larry said i i, I do have a weird optimism if, if you've listened to this by now our next episode will be episode 200 200 in the last it's roughly what 18 18 months now of rumble so be sure and listen uh, to that one my thanks to all of you who are listening to this Thank you for sharing emails with me, Mike at michaelmore.com. I love hearing your feedback on the show. On the description page, there's also a link where you can leave me a one-minute voicemail. I love to hear uh, what you have to say. Looking forward to the great month of July that we are now entering. So we have a few cool things to share with you uh, in this uh, coming month. Uh, I will thank my executive producer, Basil Hamden, our editor and sound engineer, Nick Quaz and everybody else who's been an inspiration to me and uh, to this podcast. It uh, does not go unnoticed. I greatly appreciate it to all my uh, friends and people I live and work with back in Traverse City, Michigan. Um, I hope everybody is having a good holiday. President Biden has decided to show up in our little 15,000 year round population town in Northern Michigan. Uh, so very cool on that. And um, we are uh, working to get our theaters reopened and are bringing our film festival back in the coming year here, things that we've lost uh, during the pandemic. But um, we got a great piece of news uh, here this week from the federal government 
uh, they approved our grant application. It was an act passed by Congress, the Shuttered Venues Act, to provide some funds to reopen our movie theaters, especially our indie movie theaters, and to open up concert venues, museums, playhouses where they perform live plays in towns all across this great country. They've all been shut down. Some of them aren't going to open back up. Some are struggling uh, to survive right now. And we applied along with thousands of others, and we got we got one of those grants this week. And it will, in fact, and indeed, save our Traverse City Film Festival and our State Theater and our Bijou by the Bay Cinema. So thank you, United States of America, on, uh, on your birthday for using some of our tax dollars, the government of, for, and by the people to help maintain our arts and things that uh, even in rural areas where much help um, is needed. And happy birthday to everybody in Traverse City because here this weekend on Sunday, it's the 105th birthday of our state theater. Opened 105 years ago this weekend. We have restored it. We are keeping it alive. It's a beautiful nonprofit movie palace. If you're ever in northern Michigan, please stop by. Okay, everybody, be well, and um, I will talk to you soon. This is Michael Moore, and this is Rumble.